Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Uh, today, I am delighted uh, to speak to Dr. Naoki Yamamoto. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you very much for inviting me. Salam alaikum. Welcome, salam. Dr. Naoki Yamamoto is currently a professor at the Graduate School of Turkic Studies at Mamara University in Turkey. He specializes in Ottoman Tasawwuf and traditional Japanese culture. His publications include a Japanese translation of Salami's Kitab al Futua and an introduction to Tasawwuf, a comparison with shonen manga. And I understand his presentation will cover th uh, three areas, uh, a general history of Muslims in East Asia, mainly China, and loneliness and pride as a minority Muslim. And finally, what can contemporary minority Muslims learn from the history of Islam in East Asia? So this promises to be a particularly interesting uh, video or program. So I hand it over to you, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Then I will share the screen. Uh, Uh, can you see the screen now? Yeah. Yep, perfectly clear. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, then again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, thank you for inviting me to such a great opportunity. Uh, so as you, uh, <coughs> as Ustaz Paul you know, introduced, uh, currently I am working at the Malaman University in Turkey, right in Istanbul. And my main area is the Tasawwuf in uh, in. Ottoman uh, like a period, especially Tassel in Anatolia. Uh, but after I finished my PhD, you know, I have expanded my uh, area of research. So now I'm studying with Tassel in Indonesia and Tassel in China, as a Tassel in Africa as well. But today, you know, I would like to talk about the uh, Islamic history uh, in China. Mm, mm. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So today I would like to talk about these three things. One is a general history about Islam in China. And the second is the Chinese Islamic scholarship. And the third is the a kind of like struggle of the Chinese Muslim as a minority in the Chinese empire. Mm. And before going to the main topic, like I would like to consider like what, how can I say, East Asian Islamic tradition means for us. Like especially for Muslims, like living today, like 21st century. Mm -hmm. And the first thing we need to know about like Islam in China is something that has been ignored for many years. Like, uh, like many Islamic scholarships, like current Islamic scholarships, somehow like isolated this new Islamic tradition in China from like a mainstream of the new Islamic studies. Like for example, uh, this is one of the most famous book about like you know, the diversity of Islamic civilization. It's called uh, the author's name is Vince uh, Vincent Mon Mansour Monte. He's a French Muslim like a convert. Mm. Uh, he wrote the book on you know on the five colors of Islam. Uh, this book is frankly, uh, frequently introduced by the Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad in the UK as well. So this book is basically ex explaining that how Islamic civilization had emerged from one light of Tawheed, like one vision of Tawheed, mm. uh, into five regional colors, like in you know, the Arab or the Turkic or the Malay Indonesia and Persian, Persian India region and Africa. And I think in the end, I think he anticipated the future emergence of the European Islamic culture. I think which is now it's now actually emerging right now because I see many uh, like European converts uh, in not only the UK or in Germany or the France and also you know they are like third or fourth generations of the European Muslim and I you know and I uh, often visit. Uh, visit like UK or Germany or France, and I see now you know they have like a, you know the okay, like solid identity as a European Muslim. But however, what I want to say about this book is that I didn't find any uh, East Asian yeah incredible uh, expression about Islamic civilization, mm. and this how can I say absence of East Asian legacy of Islamic civilization somehow like shocked me. Because I myself also was born in East Asia, like grew up as like a Japanese, and I you know embraced Islam like a thirteen years ago, 
And one of my friends recommended uh, recommend me to read this book. And when I read this book, you know, I was actually I was really impressed by the diversity of Islamic culture. But also in the same time, like it makes me a little bit sad that that you know these books didn't help me to say relocate myself as like an East Asian, like a Japanese convert yeah. to this Islamic civilization. Like I felt that you know I, we don't have any historical roots, you know, uh, to the, you know in Islamic history. But this is not a historical fact. You know, uh, this absence of this description about East Asian Islam is is how do I say? It's not. It's just like a mistake of you know our like you know the researchers. Uh, but actually, in fact, uh, it is not exaggeration to say that East Asia is a region with the longest tradition of the Islamic civilization. The longest and, history, you're saying, so it goes right yeah. back to nearly the beginning, right? Yes, one of the longest and one of the richest. Like this is what I want to you know introduce today, right? And in fact, like. Uh, I'm repeating that there is no heritage that presents a more useful intellectual framework, you know, for today's world than in like a Chinese like Islamic tradition. Mm. This is because Islam in China is not only the one of the pillars of the Islamic civilization, but also the pillar of the Confucian worldview, or I can say like a Tao civilization, like East Asian civilization, like which comprise like China and Korea and Japan and Vietnam, and. You know, sometimes, you know, when I make a presentation about Chinese Islam, uh, like a listener uh, will ask, uh, ask me that, why are you studying about like a Chinese Islam, even though you're like a Japanese? <laughs> yes. like, but we must not forget that, you know, the, of course, like Japan and China and Korea existed before the modernization. But what we understand now about like you know, this Japanese-ness or like a Chinese-ness or a like, Korean-ness it's just like a nation state oriented identity or nation state like a base identity. Mm. Like, and, and this is really like important for me. Like when I conduct academic research, like, you know, that we should show respect to the uh, local Islamic culture or local Islamic history, but we must not, how do I say, we must not get trapped in the format of you know the nation state, like what I want to say that you know uh, uh, that for example, like I'm Japanese and I am Japanese Muslim converts, but I but I don't want to become like a Japanese Muslim like a nationalist like who try who believe in that you know this Japanese version of Islam is like a best uh, or like a better than any other like you know local like a local uh, manifestation of of Islamic civilization. And this study about Chinese Islam is really helpful for me because uh, this study is like it makes me humble. It makes me humble means like you know the, me myself like Japan is also like a one part of this Tao civilization, in the East Asian civilization, and and me being like a Japanese Muslim converts uh, is kind of like a, uh, has a potential to understand like both Islamic civilization. And also like a Tao civilization. Mm. Like what I'm say is what I want to say is that you cannot understand like Islamic civilization without knowing Chinese Islam. And also you cannot understand East Asian civilization without knowing about like Chinese Islam. Mm. And also like uh, another thing that I want to add about this that uh, is the uh, uh, another reason that I, I'm studying about like Chinese Islam as the Japanese Muslim is that the Japan doesn't have any like you know Islamic history, basically. Like you know, the uh, interaction between like Japan and Islamic civilization is like nearly new, like especially after like uh, uh, like the since like a modernization. Mm. Like prior to like World War Second, you know, Japanese involvement with the Chinese Muslim or the other Muslim in the Islamic civilization is basically due to the Japanese government colonial policy. Ah, uh, right. So like 
um, uh, there is a clear historical record that most of the you know the first generation of the Japanese converts were actually like a spy, you know, sent by like a Japanese. Oh, really? Oh my god! Oh, my god. <laughs> not a, not a great country. beginning, though, is it? Not a great beginning if if Muslims yes. identified as spies in the country. Oh. Yes, like there is even like academic terminology for that, like a bogus Muslim, like a bogus Japanese Muslim during the modernization. Right? <laughs> so the, some of them, you know, they go to the Hajj in the you know uh, as like a Muslim, but actually, you know, they they went to like a uh, you know, Haramai to gather the information about like you know, uh, the Muslim activists. So, so uh, uh, this is so uh, as a Japanese Muslim, you know, we need to critically examine our like historical roots, and also like we need to decolonize our history as well. Like, like what I want to say that we must not make the same mistake. Like, we must not interact with like Chinese Muslim as like a political like a purpose. Or we must not in we must interact with the other Muslim with just try to convince them that, you know, we Japanese, like a Muslim, can like show the better version of Islamic Ummah. Like, you know, if, if, if that idea is truly rooted in like a traditional Islamic sciences, it may be. But, you know, this is really like a sensitive. Uh, and also, it really requires like a sincere, like intellectual work, you know, for us to be part of being the Ummah again. So that's why, like, in order to you know, like reconstruct you know, or or renew like my identity as a Japanese Muslim. You know, I may I have decided that uh, I have decided to study like in history of Islam in East Asia from the very beginning. So this is you know, this is yeah this is the main reason you know why I have started. It was, um, this might be a, a good time just to ask briefly uh, how you came to embrace Islam yourself. Oh me, so uh, I became Muslim like thirteen years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that uh, at that time, you know, I was just like an ordinary like a Japanese, like who likes like a Nintendo or like video games, so I can watch like right. a Marvel comics. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any clear vision, but the I entered uh, like Chris, uh, Doshisha University. It was once a Christian university uh, in Kyoto, and I have started to read like a lot of books about religion. Like I read the books about like Christianity. I read books about like Buddhism. I read books books of Taoism, and I found, like, one really, like, small book. Actually, I have that book. Please, like. Oh, this book. Oh, could you, could you put it back on the big screen again so we can yeah. see it? Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Could you show us so again? So in the li in the library of Doshi University, I okay. found this book. It's really small. Okay, thank you. The name of this book is like Introduction to. Uh, it's really difficult to translate. It's it's like introductory book about the God. So it didn't say like Allah or like you know the or the Islam. It said like books about the God. Right. And, but uh, the way the author articulate about the concept of Allah concept about the God or the divine or the concept of the human being or the concept about like in the this life and also hereafter like really amazed me and and uh, when I started reading this book I found that this is a book about Islam like because they uh, they also use like a uh, like special terminology but like a tawhid or like such right. uh, and I and also I found that you know the author uh, is the wife of the, you know, the professor working at the Doshi University. Mm -hmm. And I and I thought this is like a divine call, you know, because you know I got amazed about this book. So so uh so I sent the email to that professor in Doshi University, his name is Professor Hassan. And I said that you know I got, I'm really amazed about it by this book, you know, your wife's book. And it's a possible I want to meet with you, you know, to study more about like Islam or the or the history of Islam. And the professor immediately replied to me, and we met in the cafeteria. But and professor came, but once he entered the cafeteria, like he started to cry, and I got so shocked because. Uh, but uh, but he said that you know the unfortunately his wife has already passed away, uh, like in one, uh, one year ago. Oh no. Uh, and uh, but he said that you know when he read my email, like he remembered one hadith, you know, like you know the behavior, like amal, 
you know, act of the human being will continue even after, you know, him or her death yeah, yeah, in, yeah. Three, in the following three forms. One is sadaka jariya, and the, sadaka, and the second is like a knowledge. And the third is a prayer of the prayer of the children, you know, dua of the children. Oh, right. And he said that, you know, that now, you know, his most beloved wife, uh, he, she already passed away, uh, but her life still continues in the form of Elam, you know, the knowledge. Mm. And now he said that he saw his wife in my heart. Gosh. And, yeah. and I think at the time he was only like 50 years old or 55, I, uh, I think 50, I don't 50 years old, but he was, <laughs> he cries so hard. And, and he, uh, but he said that, you know, that I'm really sorry that, you know, that, my, uh, that, that he, uh, that I couldn't introduce my wife. And he said that, but I want to become your sensei. The sensei is mean teacher in Japanese. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So this is my first, first encounter with like, you know, this, uh, with the Islam or the Muslims. Sure, and, uh, this, and the you know, professor, uh, really uh, taught me a lot about Islam and history of Islam and also the Muslim society. Like he, he, uh, he even brought me to travel to like Malaysia and also Indonesia. And he even uh, went to Cairo uh, all together with me. And, and I took uh, like a basic Arabic course in Cairo. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, he, uh, Pro Professor Hassan also came to Cairo and he introduced him one Sheikh from an Azhar University. And, and the, uh, when we meet, you know, the professor from Azhar University, he said that now, now Professor Hassan is there. And also there's a professor from the Azhar University. These are two, like Shahid. So he said that, why did you become Muslim? Right. And to be honest, I didn't think that uh, so seriously. You know, I, at the time, I never thought about like, if I become Muslim, I cannot eat pork forever. Or, you know, there was a very favorite like potato chips, which, which, which contains like, you know, the gelatin or something. But, but uh, at the time as well, I saw this like a divine call. Like, and, mm. and, you know, uh, I think, uh, Ustaz Paul, you are also Muslim converts, right? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, if you're a Muslim convert, like, like uh, the people always ask us, like, you know, why did you become Muslim? Well, what brings you to the Islam? And, and people always want like kind of like a special answer for it. Like, yeah. like they, they always expect like a dramatic, I don't know. Exactly. Like, yeah. exactly. Well, <laughs> like, my story is so boring. I hate, hate to talk about it. That's why I never talk about it. Yeah. Like during the ep episode, like we can be shown in like a Marvel hero comics or like a Star Wars, like a saga or something. <laughs> but, uh, mm -hmm. but for me, I don't have a really strong reason for it. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, this, uh, this book and also the professor, we helped me a lot, but that wasn't really enough for me. Mm. Like uh, meeting with a sincere, like sincere Muslim teacher, and also like encounter with a real book was enough for me to become Muslim. And after that, you know, I try to, I try not to have like specific reason I continue being a Muslim. Because if I have a, like special, like a specific, like a drama or like a dramatic reason, then uh, in some period, you will feel that, you know, you got deceived by it. Like, Mm. Am I explaining myself clear? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because becoming Muslim is just one point of your history. It's a journey, isn't it? It's not just like you, you arrive at a destination and that's it. It's a process, a journey that continues throughout your entire life, isn't it? Yeah, yeah like this is not the ending of my, like, you Naoki Yamamoto's, like, you know, the saga. Like, you know, this is just <laughs> one, what, even, and this also, this is not just, this is also not the beginning. This is one point of my, in his, my history. Yeah. And what is important is that try try to uh, continue to be a Muslim, like you keep the Muslim identity. Mm. So now also have like you know, some of the Japanese Muslim converts, but I always trying to tell them that you know uh, we don't have to become like superhero of like a Muslim Ummah or something. Like you don't you don't need like a dramatic episode. Like you don't need to be like you know the super duper like a moral example of the Muslim community. Like, uh, and this is actually advice from my professor Hassan too. Like, you know, before I become Muslim, I even asked him that, you know, that uh, uh, I don't think I cannot be like a best Muslim, you know, even if I become Muslim, because like uh, I might make mistakes and I don't have enough knowledge. And also I'm Japanese, you know, I don't have any like a Islamic background. But yeah. Professor Hassan, even though the, uh, uh, he said that, 
you know, we all make mistake, mistake, and we also fall, and we are not we are not perfect. You know, we are all imperfect. He said that we can just become like a sinful Muslim, mm. but we can always try to make a tawbah for it. And this is what you know, Muslims are. The like Muslim were, you know, have been, and also you know, Muslim are, and the Muslim will be like. You know. Yeah, no, that's very sweet. No, it's very, very, very helpful. Uh, what he said, very true. Yeah. So we are we? we? Oh, shall we talk? Yeah. A bit? <laughs> no, no, okay, please, Karen, thank you for sharing. I, I kind of diverted you from your presentation. Yeah. Uh, so sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, shall I go go back to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Actually, I can talk about you know the, this first story, but you know it takes like two hours or three hours because <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm also like been Muslim for thirteen years, so I can. Oh, sorry, this is not. This is the draft. Okay. Okay, oh, see the screen. Yeah, lovely. Yep. Oh, okay, I'm starting. Lovely. <laughs> So let's say I was saying that you know this in studying about Chinese Islam is to know about like both Islamic civilization and the Dao civilization. And I know like you know when I talk about this Chinese Islam, you know, this sounds really exotic. Like you know, this is something like you know, with the two elements which doesn't have any any, I'm gonna say, like a common ground. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I want to show this more. For example, like look at this mosque, for example. Like yeah. this mosque is the oldest mosque in China. And it was built in like 742, like 742. Now the like, prophet was, himself died, didn't he? In about 630, 632 AD, so to speak, of the yes. So, so this is yeah. a hundred years of the, the death of the prophet in Arabia. In China, <laughs> we have a mosque already being built. Yeah. So you know, this in Chinese Islam exists even during the, you know, the period of Sahaba. So during the Sahaba, and, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And the Chinese Empire built this masjid for you know Arab and the Persian merchants you know coming to China. Right. And even prior to that, and if you look up the historical record, uh, the first Muslim, which is found in Je in China, is like six hundred and fifty one. It's even six hundred fifty one. Well, that's 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 definitely the, the first generation of the Sahaba, isn't it? It's amazing. Yes. Well, uh, it may be a legend. But this mosque is like his, you know, uh, it's a historic historical building. Like you know, they, uh, at least you know, we we can clearly see that you know the Islam has reached to China in the eighth century. Hmm. So, so you know, this is like a good example, you know, best example that there is a rich history of interaction between China and Islamic civilization. Hmm. And now, and another beautiful thing about this mosque is that. Uh, I mean, this mosque itself has been reconstructed like several times. I right. think the first version of the mosque was more like an Arab-oriented, like an architect uh, architecture. Right. But now this mosque has really like a Chinese like atmosphere, right? Mm. Yeah. Yes, like, right. like even if you can if you see this uh, building in Japan, like you know, I'm sure Japanese will think that this is like a Buddhist like a temple, or like an you know, or I don't know, like Shinto, like a temple. I mean, this is more like a Buddhist temple, but yeah. like this means, like this China has completely observed this you know, Islamic element or Islamic comment in uh, con uh, context, and they these Chinese Muslims or even the Chinese Empire, like there was the they were able to articulate this Islamic con uh, Islamic concept into their own own local like a culture. Mm. Ah. Okay. So next, uh, I want to talk about like a uh, brief picture about Muslim in China. So I keep saying like you know Chinese Muslim or like you know in the Chinese Islam, but uh, uh, but who are like Ch this Chinese Muslim? So when the media talks about like a Chinese Muslim, I'm sure I've seen one, uh, almost one hundred percent. You know, it, this is mostly about like Uyghur, you know, the people in China. Yes, like right. in particular, like a Chinese government, like brainwashing and oppression against them, no one so called like re education program. Yeah, uh, like if you are interesting about the uh, knowing about the, you know, the oppression, I think the Al Jazeera uh, made a uh, really like a good doc documentary about that, like re education camp. Yeah, yeah, so uh, and but if you look, look at the map of the Muslim population in China, 
uh, you will see that in addition to the Uyghur ethnic, bo- uh, ethnic group and there are b- various other Muslim ethnic groups such as Han Chinese and actually Han Chinese are the majority I mean like a Chinese yeah. Like Chinese, like Chinese, like and Uyghur is like second largest like a uh, has population, and the third is like a Kazakh, you know, Kazakhstan, and other is like a Donsha Muslim. Like Donsha is uh is believed that you know, they come from like a Mongolia, like in the Mon- like a Mongolian like a Muslims or the Kurgus on the Salah, uh, Salahs and so on, like Uzbek and Tatar. Like and there are so many like a Turkic uh, Muslim, uh, Turkic Chinese Muslim as well. Mm-hmm. And the Muslim makes up makes up about two percent of the Chinese population, uh, which is estimated to be like around like you know, twenty five million. Right. Now, if you say two percent, like it sounds like you know they're minor, uh, really super minority, but Chinese population is huge. So even two percent is like really yeah. Minor. I was I was thinking that yeah, two percent of a huge population is still a huge number. Twenty five million Chinese Muslims. Yeah. Yes. And. Traditionally, like Chinese Muslim live widely throughout China. Uh, they mm-hmm. go, uh, uh, and have been living as a minority in each region. So, you know, Chinese are living almost like every, every city, like every region. Mm-hmm. Uh, but usually, you know, they live as a minority, like 10% of the you know, population of you know, each city, or 10 or 20. But the only exception is the Xinjiang Uyghur, Ottomanist region, like here. The, Uy- the Uyghurs, the ones who have been persecuted by... Uh, yes. The moment, yeah. In Japan. So this is where the you sixty know, percent of population is that we will say, like the sixty percent. So the majority, uh, the majority in that region of China is Muslim in that particular region of China. Okay. Uh, yes, and the next largest district of the Muslim population, Ninsha, and but still Ninsha is where about thirty percent percent of the population is Muslim. Right. So, so it's, a minority, it's a minority. So the Uyghur is the only region of China where the majority of the, the population in that area are Muslim. And the, the second largest population group is only 30%. So that's a minority in that other region. Right. Uh, yes. Like this is one of the main reasons that why Chinese government want to take a control, you know, uh, control over the Uyghur region uh, because, you know, uh, because the Muslim consider majority. So, so it might uh, like scare the like a dominance of the, 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 Chinese, the Chinese government, of course, is communist. It's officially atheist and Marxist, and therefore it's you know rejects religion uh, as a matter of state policy, I suppose. But it's the Uyghurs are obviously Muslims, and they don't reject. Uh, obviously, would reject atheism as well. So I can see there's a natural conflict there, ideological conflict between the two. Uh, yes, yeah. and. Islam in China is conventionally referred as like so-called four school and four tariqa. Mm-hmm. And this school is it's really difficult to uh, define this, but in terms of mazhab, you know, the uh, jurisprudence, mm-hmm. but traditionally all Chinese Muslim are Hanafi school of law. The Hanafi, okay. Uh, this is because the, the, the Islam, you know, came to China uh, from the Anatolian, like, uh, uh, like Central Asia. Yeah. And... In Central Asia, like Hanafi school was the most influential, like jurisprudence, like Islamic jurisprudence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. if you go back to the you know, like, you know, and here they there's a lot of like mountains. So, as you can see in you know, the lines, so it re- so it's uh, it's really difficult from the people to enter to China from like in, uh, Indian region. Oh. Uh, so geographically, you know, they they have uh, the it, it was like relatively easier to interact with the Central Asia. So, so you know, by uh, with the many reasons, you know, the Chinese Muslim, you know, uh, uh, install, I can say, like in is uh, like Islam, uh, uh, Islamic intellectual tradition from Central Asia. So that's why you know they, uh, uh, in traditionally, uh, they are all like Hanafi schools, right? And the Qadim is considered as so called like a traditional uh, traditionalist, and the Ikhwan is more like a it's like a Salafi oriented, like a slightly like a reformist oriented, like a group, uh, which emerged during the 18th century. And at that time, you know, there was the uh, so-called uh, Hadith reform movement emerged in the cent- in, emerged in Haramai, in the Makkah and Medina, mm-hmm. and it influenced the whole uh, region in Islamic civilization, not only in China but also like in Anatolia. Interesting, yeah, and and also India, and uh, and also like Egypt and Arab and so on, and they also reached the uh, in, into China 
and they formed a school called like Ehuan. And Shi Dao Tan is also traditionalist, but they're more uh, focusing on the uh, uh, studying the is, uh, Islamic classic with the Chinese language. Mm. And the Salafi is Salafi. Um, Salafi is always Salafi. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and they also like uh, there were also like four major Sufi tariqa in China. Uh, first one in Qadriya, and uh, second Kubrawiya. Kubrawiya is a Kubrawiya tariqa from uh, is from Central Asia, and also Naqshbandiya. And Naqshbandiya has like two uh, branches. One is Khufiya, and the second one is Jahriya. So. Yeah, the difference between Khufi and Jahriya is the uh, the method of the zikr. So Khufiyas they prefer like a silent zikr, and the Jahriyas they uh, they prefer like a vocal vocal zikr. Mm. But this uh, Naqshbandi is one of the most influential Sufi tariqa you know during the uh, history of China, uh, in China. And sometimes there was a conflict between like a Jahriya Sufi tariqa and also like a Ch- uh, Chinese emperor. And also about the mosque, uh, there are actually 34,000 mosques in China wow. currently, wow. and the Uyghur region has additional like 24,000. So it's a lot. And, and there are more, so actually it means that there are more mosques in the Xinjiang Uyghur region than in England, France, or Germany combined, I think. <laughs> right. So there's one uh, European journalist, I think he, he tried to criticize like Chinese government, like a policy about Muslim. And the Chinese, dip, I think Chinese diplomat or politician, I think, like she replied that, you know, that uh, she asked, I think she was is a British journalist, I think. She, oh. she asked, like, you know, do you know how many numbers of mosques you know, exist in the UK? And the journalist, the journalist couldn't answer it. And British said, actually, in Xinjiang Uyghur, Uyghur region, there is a 24,000 like a mosque. And she said that, you know, but you, but even England, I think like, uh, uh, do you know how many how many mosques in England right now? I think well, I've, I've no, I, I've never, I don't know. Uh, it's difficult. Oh. It's not easy to figure because you get mosques in people's houses or in shops as well. And does, does that count as a mosque or not? You know, and does it have to be open for all five prayers to be counted as a mosque or not? And it's it's not always very clear what is a mosque. I think. Okay, so this is one of the you know propaganda that Chinese government want to do is that. Oh. You know, that just see the number of mosque. Like this shows that actually we are not like cruel to the Muslim, but uh-huh. we, are, we are really ready to interrogate those Muslim in our country. Right? Yeah. But uh, but forget about pro- uh, but beside the propaganda, like you know the uh, uh, I mean if you see the number number of the mosque, you, know, you, uh, you can clearly see that these huge Muslim community are living in China. Mm-hmm. And as I said, you know this is one of the uh, this uh, uh, this masjid. Is the, uh, one of the oldest like masjid, uh, masjid in China, and it was it was built like seven hundred and forty two. So Islam has been uh, sorry, Islam in China has has been has a presence in China from virtually the beginning. Uh, so a very long continuous history dating back to well the, the, at least to seven four two A D. But obviously, yes, like you know, if you believe the, you know the uh, if you believe the, you know this history, then it means that you know Chinese Islam has the like. Is much older than like a Persian like Islamic history, oh, or no. or the Indonesian Islamic history, or the African Islamic history. Wow, yeah. amazing! So I will go. Uh, I'm going to talk about you know, a brief history of Chinese Islam. So uh, the presence of Muslim in China can be traced back to the Tang Dynasty, mm-hmm. and during this period, Muslim were foreigners. Who came from outside the country, like such as like Arab or like Persian merchants, yeah. and it was not until the Yuan Dynasty, you know, the Mongolian Dynasty, uh, the presence of Muslim in China like increased. So during the Tang Dynasty, Tang Tang Dynasty, uh, there were like Muslim merchants like from Arab or the Persian region, but uh, their activities were like limited, like restricted, and they were not allowed to interact with the other like you know, the Hui Hui Chinese. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so there was like in you know, the community, uh, but the community was completely like you know, uh, composed of the Arab or Persian merchants. So they don't have any interaction. But the Yuan Dynasty, you know, the Mongolian Dynasty, uh, since they are more like a, a Mongolians, uh, they uh, in order to keep the power against the who uh, maj- uh, like a Chinese majority, they initiatively. Uh, 
like selected like a Muslim like engineers and soldier craftsmen from outside, and they appointed them in an important position. So during this time, uh, you know, Muslims started to spread you know, throughout the China. Mm -hmm. So, however, like it was also during this period that prejudice began to rise among Chinese, become uh, rise among Chinese, because Muslim came to China with, as say, with a culture of the custom like different from from those of like Han Chinese. Mm -hmm. So, still, this even this Yuan Dynasty, this Yuan Dynasty brought like in the uh, like thousands of the Muslim from outside of China, but you know, but still they are like aliens. Like they are appointed as elite, you know, they are like spe specialists about engineering or soldiers or craftsmen, or they are appointed in the important role in politics. But uh, still, uh, uh, they were not integrated to like a Chinese society. Right. So still seen as outsiders, even though they were given these positions within the Chinese state. Yeah, interesting. Yes. Yeah. And uh, during the mean. Uh, during this early Ming Dynasty, you know, the, uh, uh, Ming Dynasty, you know, those Muslim elites, you know, these so-called outsiders like Muslim, they lost the support from Yuan you know, you know, uh, you know, uh, Dynasty, and and the empire like it began to desire the so-called like Sinization or like Sinization, I can say, like making them like a Chinese, yeah, the Muslims. And also they banned like speaking Arabic and Persian and Turkic language in the public. Wow. And in like 1372, the empire forbade Muslims from marrying each other. I mean, the marrying, uh, like marrying like Arab or Turkic or like Persian. So they so-called encouraged them to marry Han Chinese. Mm -hmm. So this led like generation after generation to Chinese Muslims forgetting their native languages, native like Arabic and Persian, Turkic and their culture. And their custom and the culture become like a Han Chinese. Right. So this uh, Ming Dynasty is is the is the time that you know these uh, uh, Muslims began to in, get integrated into like a Chinese society. So if we see if we only look about this you know, the empire's like a policy, like we only see like a like a oppressive side, but also we must forget that you know this Chinese empire tried to in integrate Muslim in the Chinese society, and some of the emperor, like they are really interested about like knowing the Islamic culture and also Muslim community, and we a good example in the 14th century this Hongwu emperor. And he was the he was one of the rare figure. Was very interesting in Islamic culture and Muslim, and he himself authored like a poem, uh, a poem for like a you know, Prophet Muhammad, so I person. Wow. And this, this is the you know. So it's an emperor of China actually writing a poem praising the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. And I, I'd like to, uh, if, if I may, in a second, just to read an English translation of this amazing poem, because I think it really needs, deserves to be much better known in the West. Uh, but he, here we have, you know, a, a, an emperor of China uh, praising the, uh, the Prophet in very, very wonderful terms, a eulogy indeed. Hmm. So uh, shall I just um, read oh. that? Yeah, I'll just read that poem out then. Um, uh, this is an English translation, obviously. I, I can't speak the, the Chinese. It's called, in English, a hundred character eulogy to Muhammad upon whom be peace by the Chinese emperor and founder of the Ming dynasty, uh, known as Hong Wu. And uh, his dates are 1328 to 1398 of the Common Era. And the poem in English goes as follows. From the beginning of the universe, heaven has already appointed the great sage born in the West who transmits and teaches. He received heavenly scripture in a 30 part book to guide all creatures. Master and teacher of myriads, leader of countless sages with the support from the divine to protect his nation's people with five daily prayers, silently wishing for peace with his heart toward the true Lord, inspiring the poor ones, saving them from calamity, seeing through the unseen, redeeming souls and spirits from all wrongdoings, 
a mercy to the world, leading the path for the, for the past and the present, reducing evil to the one. The name of his teaching, pure and true, Muhammad, the most noble sage. So that's an incredibly moving uh, poem by this Chinese emperor. The question is, has to be asked, was he a Muslim? I mean, he, he, uh, surely this comes from a Muslim heart and Muslim mind. This is not someone who's outside of the fold of Islam, surely. So what, what, what evidence do we know about this, this particular emperor? Yes, like in, there, is, there is no clear record. At any rate, he embraced it something, but you know there is a like there is a historical like record that he has a lot of like Muslim advisors and also like uh, also Islam. Also, he had the connection with the, the many like Islamic scholars, and he knows a lot about Islam. And even this poem is very really powerful. You know, this means utmost sage. Uh, he called the Prophet Muhammad like utmost sage, and traditionally the uh, most uh, say, respected you know, sage in the history of the China is the Confucius. Confucius, exactly. And, but the Muslim scholar, they claim that you know, the prophet is the, you know, this, so they say that Confucius is a sage from the East oh. and the Prophet Muhammad is a sage from the West. Wow. And the Muslim scholar claim that you know, the Chinese Muslim is the one who Incred, uh, integrate the ideals or the vision of you know, the sage from the east and the sage from the west. Mm. Uh, but here, the you know, Chinese emperor, in a, a, at least this poem, he acknowledged that the you know, Prophet Muhammad is the utmost sage. Like, I mean, imagine that, like, for example, like a Japanese emperor will write like a Japanese poem that he said that, you know, that Prophet Muhammad is actually the origin of the old entities or like epistemologies. Or the, the, or the divine creation. Like this is kind of, uh, so this poem is kind of like this. Like, like, like for example, like you, you are from the UK, but imagine that like Queen Elizabeth will write the po poem about the Prophet Muhammad. And he said that, you know, the Prophet Muhammad actually should be the head of, I don't know, the English church or something like that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, that is shocking. Presumably, perhaps we, he didn't make a clear public statement about his faith if he, if he was a Muslim, because it would have had, Repercussions. It would have been politically. It would have been quite problematic, maybe, for him. Okay. In a similar way, some people have alleged. I don't know if it's true or not. Of course, it, that Prince Charles in the United Kingdom here has, uh, has is actually has said the Shahada secretly. But uh, of course, to say that publicly would have massive impact on the political constitutional realities. So maybe that's a uh, secret or kept confidential uh, in a similar way. Perhaps that this Hongwu Emperor of China also was privately. Uh, committed to Islam, but uh, couldn't say so publicly. But still, he wrote this poem, which is about nearly as close as you can get to admitting it without actually saying it, perhaps. Uh, yes. No. Well, at least like, I can say, you know, from this poem that, you know, we cannot, you know, we must not romanticize the past, but this poem shows that, you know, Chinese emperor acknowledged the importance of, you know, uh, Islam, uh, of Islam. And also they acknowledge that, uh, that uh, they, you know, they have to say, believe that Muslim community is uh, not something we should be like this, uh, should be de respected. Like, you know, mm. you know, this Muslim community should be respected. And also, you know, they should be like a part, uh, the, the part of the Chinese community. Like, if they don't have this kind of like intention, they will never write you know, the poem like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, very, very amazing. And second was the intellectual, uh, intellectual tradition of Chinese Islam. Oh, before that, in uh, so after the Ming Dynasty, in the Qin Dynasty, the 17th century, like in, uh, in 17th century, uh, this Chinese emperor, like new trade policy, brought Islamic books from the West, and that this period saw the emergence of Muslim intellectual. Like such as like Wang Dayu or Mardi Singh or the Liu Zi, who wrote Islamic books in Chinese. Yeah. So this is a period in which the knowledge of Islamic sciences observed the Chinese cultural context and becomes like a true, like a truly like a local tradition. So 
so during the Ming Dynasty, also there is like in a poem, and also there is like you know the like Arab or Persian mar- like Muslim merchants or like Muslim like you know the politicians or engineers like you know, and also the, even the Chinese emperor acknowledge the existence of Muslim community with with respect. But uh, but in during the Xin Dynasty, uh, this is a time where you know uh, they eventually have so called local Chinese Islamic scholars. Like not just like a Muslim scholars, but you know they 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 are uh, major enough to produce like in the Muslim elite you know, who can be comparable to the other like a Taoist elite or like a Buddhist elite. Right. And how does you know uh, you know Islamic uh, in Chinese Islamic intellectual uh, had education. Uh, <clears throat> So Chinese Muslim have traditionally have been educated in called madrasa called like Jintan, uh, affiliated to the mosque, and uh, and in this jin, uh, and the traditional education in this madrasa is called like a Jintan education, and in Jintan education, the like, teachers teach the traditional Islamic curriculum such as like Arabic grammar and theology and jurisprudence and like a hadith studies and so on. Oh. So the, this is like really typical like a, a traditional like a curriculum. Uh, which is uh, which is taught in like Central Asia or the Ottoman Empire or the other Middle East and so on. You know they share the you know same curriculum, and the teaching material in Tasawwuf you know sometimes vary from region to region. Like sometimes they teach Tasawwuf in Persian or sometimes they teach uh, Tasawwuf in Arabic. Mm-hmm. And those who could teach like a traditional Islamic studies were called Ahong, and Ahong is mm-hmm. come, uh, come from Persian is called Ahande. It means that those who have the traditional Islamic knowledge, like ulama, or like, Jew, like, Jew. like for example, like Yuzi, uh, who I will introduce later, uh, was born uh, born in this Ahun family, like elite family. Mm. And combination of two process means like increase the number of Chinese speaking Muslim due to the policy of the, you know, the uh, Ming Dynasty and Xin Dynasty. And also the influx of Islamic classic uh, from the Islamic civilization, uh, civilization led to the emergence of the elite in China who could read Arabic and Persian and articulate those concepts in like Chinese languages. Mm-hmm. So they began to write Islamic books in like Han Chinese, like a classic Chinese languages for the Hui people who lacked the literacy of Arabic and Persian literacy. So this is can I say, uh, in some aspect, this is like a sincere, like academic, uh, like endeavor, you know, to try articulate Islamic concept in the local language. But I think, you know, somehow this is how I interpret. But this is also how they try to resist the the how can I say like integration, like a policy of the Chinese em- Chinese Empire. Like you know, the the majority of Muslim community uh, are uh, have lost the literacy of Arabic and Persian. And they have lost the accessibility to the original like a text, which is written in Islamic civilization. But yet, they try not to lose the whole identity. Right. And so this is how they say that if they lost the literacy of Arabic or Persian or the Turkic languages, then they will start to express Islam in Chinese language. It means try to Islamize the Chinese language. So, yeah. Yes. Interesting. And this literature. You know, the Islamic book, uh, book written in Chinese language is called Han Kitab. Han means Chinese language, and the Kitab is Kitab. Like in China, they don't... They, 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 there. You have a Chinese word and an Arabic word. Kitab is obviously Arabic for book, and the Han is presumably Chinese for, as you say, for, for Chinese. Uh, or, yes, like half Chinese and half Arabic. And, a composite, yeah. And this is one of the most amazing things about Islamic civilizations. Like, you know, whenever you go, if you hear the word Kitab, then there is a Muslim community. Yeah. What well, is there is a Muslim scholar? Like, uh, if you go to like, uh, for example, in Malaysia or Indonesia, like Islamic book is called kitab. Right. Like ordinary book called buku. You know, buku is from you know Dutch. You know, it's from European language. So they they may so uh, they still keep the word you know kitab you know, to uh, so that you know people can understand when 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 someone utter the word kitab, then people understand you know they're talking about something about Islam. Yeah. And and Turkey is also the same. Uh, you know, the book is called Kitab. Right. Uh, plural form is a kit- Kitab. Lab. 
And in, 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 in the Arab region, of course, Kitab is a Kitab because it's serving. Arabic word. Uh, yeah, so, and in Africa, in Islamic book is also called a Kitab. So, so personally, sometimes, uh, you know, I call in you know, Islamic civilization is the Kitab civilization. Huh. Uh, yeah. Because uh, this in the Kitab is somehow like, you know, re, uh, unite us and yeah. keep us like identity as, you know, the part in you know, a member of the Ummah. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. So this Han Kitab is like an Islamic book written in the like, Chinese character. Mm-hmm. And, <clears throat> and sometimes, uh, for example, this is one of the tough, uh, translation of Quran. I think this is Surah Al-Fatiha, the first one. I recognize Bismillah at yeah. the top there. Yes. I Bismillah. Yeah. There's two, two methods to write, oh, no, to translate the Arabic words into Chinese. One is transliteration, and another is like translation. And I think this, uh, yeah, this line is the transliteration. It shows how to pronounce oh, right. Arabic characters. And the line below it, it this is like a translation. So this is how they try to keep the literacy of the Arabic languages, and also try to you know uh, to uh, increase the literacy of the you know, Islamic concept as well. So and the genre of the Han Kitab are really diverse. Uh, it includes like a general worldview of Islam, you know, the concept of Allah or the al of Islam, you know, periods of Islam, or the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu or the Idum al Kalam, you know, the theology or the jurisprudence. And Tasawo. And even these Han Kitab are the martial arts, like a Kung Fu. Like I will talk about it later. <laughs> okay. And if you see the Han Kitab, like uh, this is also another like Han Kitab. This is called a Wong Gong Ye, the five phase of the moon. Uh, this is written by the Islamic scholar called the like, Gedusi. And uh, and this Han Kitab itself is also like, like a museum of the Islamic history. Mm. What I'm mean saying is that if you read this Chinese character, you can see like a Buddhist vocabulary or the like, Taoist vocabulary or the Confucianist vocabulary, but it all uh, it integrate into like one system or like a Tawhid. Mm. So Islamic scholar in China, they read, uh, carefully select the proper word and borrow the vocabulary from like in the uh, like Buddhism and Tao, Tao, Taoism and Confucianism and try to articulate the Islam in like a best way you know, for the you know, Chinese audiences. And if you're interested about the, uh, especially I'm talking about the English speakers, now if you're interested about the history or the uh, of the Han Kitab, I recommend I recommend you to read this uh, these two book. The first one, the first Islamic classic in Chinese. Uh, this is this translation of the Han Kitab uh, written by Wan Dayu. Uh, and this is translated by the Professor Sachiko Murata. And uh, this one is also translated by Sach- uh, Professor Sachiko Murata as well. This is Sage Learning of Luzi. This is Luzi's like Han Kitab. It's like a metaphysical, uh, it, it metaf- uh, metaphysical, uh, philosophy or theology mm. uh, written by the Ducies. So, and what is uh, what is this Chinese Islamic scholarship? Is that I can say that you know, this Chinese Islamic scholarship is a method to articulate Islamic worldview with a vocabulary developed in a Chinese philosophical and a cultural context. Yeah, so, isn't that, isn't that the, the traditional kind of the yin and the yang symbol there in the middle of that? that uh, yes. No, that was, surrounded by really Arabic good. language. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, this is a really good example. So this diagram, first drawn by Yuzi, uh to explain the how the Islamic concept of creation, you know, the khalq, you know, the divine creation, uh, 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 will not contradict with the understanding of you know Confucianist like a worldview or metaphysics. Right. So right. he drew this yin yang diagram and tried to explain that you know this dynamism is like created like Allah. Right. Uh, because usually the ordinary like non-Muslim Chinese, you know, they deny the concept of you know the creator and they say that you know, we are creating, for example, we can create uh, like a table or I don't know, uh, like houses. 
or the car. I mean, there is no car at the time, but, yeah. but so and then we can create thing. And how come there is a creator like behind us? So usually try. So usually basically trying to show that actually this dyne that we are we understand that this dynamism is created by human being, but actually it's not. Mm-hmm. But actually there is like utmost like a creator behind us, yeah. mm-hmm. and yeah. and this book is also later uh, translated into Arabic by the Ma Liuan Yuang. Uh, he's also like a Chinese Islam scholar. Like he traveled to the Bombay and he pu- published the Arabic translation of Hankita uh, during the 20th century. Mm-hmm. So this is like Arabic translation of the Hankita. So, so this Arabic translation is also a really good historical record that Han Kitab is not just like a local book, which is just read by the Chinese Muslim. You know, there was also like Arabic like a translation and Muslim outside of China were also reading the Han Kitab. Now, even there was like you know, the small number of it. Mm-hmm. So what I keep trying to say is that, you know, we have, we are in some, some way like a collective amnesia about this heritage. Yeah, yeah. Like once this Chinese Islamic civilization were connected, I mean, Islamic civilization were united under the light of Tawhid. But unfortunately, you know, we forgot their tradition and we don't even know the richness of the, you know, the East Asian Islam. Extraordinary. And going back to the freedom of like Yuzi, like uh, Yuzi is like a great scholar in the Chinese Islamic history. So like, he can be called like you know like a Chinese version of like a Ghazali, like you know. the, the Chinese. He's a, yeah, the equivalent figure in Chinese uh, Islam, the Al Ghazali in the Arab uh, in the Arab or Persian world. Yes, like you know, in Middle East, like everybody knows Al Ghazali. Like if you are interested in like Islamic scholarship, like even in China as well. Like if you are in, uh, if you are in the Muslim community, like and everybody knows about Yuzi's legacy, and. Uh, then there is a really famous like a book also by Yuzi. It's called like a, uh, the like Tianfan series. Tianfan means like a divine, or like, uh, uh, so. This was Tianfan. Uh, 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 he wrote the three books about like the uh, metaphysics, metaphysical philosophy about Islam, and also like a practical aspect of Islam. And he also authored the Chinese translation of the uh, the life of the Prophet Muhammad. Yeah. So basically, the like, Yuzi say like uh, establish the intellectual you know, ground uh, for like you know, for the Chinese Islamic scholarship. Mm-hmm. And yeah. another interesting fa- uh, uh, the aspect about Yuzi's legacy is that some scholars like even claim that you know neo Confucianism. Like there is a Confucianism and neo Confucianism, and neo Confucianism is like a reform version of the Confucianism. Uh, it was this new Confucianism had uh, developed like a metaphysical uh, like aspect of right. uh, philosophy because the, the old, older version of Confucianism is more like a practical oriented. But some scholars claim that this new Confucianism was created under the influence of the disused Islamic theology. Yeah, interesting. So even though they claim that you know, this new Confucianism could be like an offshoot of you know the Chinese Islamic like a calamity. So that would be fascinating if there was some kind of influence there. But uh, I'm also it's interesting from the more kind of more general perspective uh, in in the Arab world that the um, that there was um, a, a, an early kind of embrace or, or ad- adoption of key Aristotelian or Hellenistic mm-hmm. philosophical terms um, in Kalam theology, or famously. But it seems that in 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 China uh, they didn't adopt. Uh, or, or have uh, um, interest in Aristotle so much, but in Confucian, uh, Confucianism, Confucian uh, terms and, and metaphysics and philosophy, that's, that's the, the, the intellectual um, exchange or, or influence or symbiosis there. Uh, uh, unlike in the Arab world, it was with the, the Hellenistic philosophical tradition. So there was a bifurcation. There was a, a clear difference uh, between Chinese Islam and Arabic Islam, if I can put it that way, in their... In, in the intellectual encounters they had in the surrounding cultures. Uh, yes, like you're completely right. Like, uh, like, for example, uh, I think you know, many Islamic scholars believe that when you talk about like, Islamic philosophy, uh, it means like, you know, the Islamic philosophy which observed the Aristotelian like a worldview. Exactly. But, and they think that this is on the only kind of Islamic philosophy yes. in the history of Islam. But this is not a historical fact. I mean, 
It is true that Islamic civilization is an inheritor of the Hellenism in the Greek philosophy, but at the same time, Islamic civilization is inheritor of the you know, Confucian, uh, Confucianistic like, tradition as well. Wow. So, and I think this makes the Islamic civilization great uh, because there is no other civilization which can in which can integrate both Hellenistic like worldview and also Confucianistic like worldview. Amazing. Yeah. Like it means that Islamic civilization has like every aspect of the human you know, human history. Mm-hmm. And even the Chinese Muslim, you know, they also study like a logic, like a Greek logic, uh, because they also uh, they also follow the uh, like uh, they use the similar like a curriculum which was used in like Ottoman Empire. But they also know a really lot about like the, the Confucian philosophy. And later, I will introduce like, another Islamic scholar called like Ji Tianzu. But he said that, but he even claimed that Chinese Muslim are the best exemplar or the best practitioner of the Confucian uh, Confucianism, the like Confucian wow. philosophy. Wow. Hmm. Sure, man. I was going to ask about because this whole idea I mean, in, in what way are, are Islam and Confucianism similar? Because uh, I'm, I'm sure many viewers, including myself, know very little about the Confucian worldview. So this is this is a very relevant uh, slot okay. that we're talking about here. Yeah. And so this Liu Zi, you know, the, you know, the Chinese version of Ghazali, you know, the greatest scholar, like he believed that you know teaching of Islam did not con- contradict the Asian teaching of China. And this is a bit long, but I want to quote uh, his words from his Han Kitab. He said, although these rites and rituals are contained in the books of heaven, it means Islam, like Islamic books, they do not differ much from those in Confucian canons. And following the rites and rituals of heaven is like following the ancient teaching of our ancestors in China. Okay. The teaching of the saints uh, are basically the same in the East and the West. So here, East means Confucian, uh, Confucius. And the West uh, means like uh, Prophet Muhammad. And are almost the same in Asian and modern times. Uh, and it is only because the later generation did not preach it in the Asian teaching, were neglected in the East, but formally, well, fortunately, the reach of Islam were preserved. So this is how you know the Chinese Islamic scholar tried to prove that the Chinese Muslim are not only like a you know, member of the Chinese Chinese community and Chinese society, but actually they like they are the best or the best or the best version of Chinese in the Chinese. Mm-hmm. So, and in the Confucianism, you know, the traditional Confucianism, they don't talk much about like a metaphysical like a, a level mm. uh, of the world. You know, they mo- mostly like focus on uh, like a morality or like or the practical side. Mm. Of, of, uh, of the human uh, of a human society, and so so uh, Islamic uh, Chinese Islamic scholar, you know, why they observe you know this in Asian teaching of the Confucius or the other like in uh, our Chinese philosophy, uh, they found out you know fo- focusing on akhlaq and the morality could be the best way to convince the Chinese audiences to uh, to know the Chinese uh, China, no, that Islam is not alien to them. Mm-hmm. So that's why you know they all they always focus on these rites and rituals. These rites and rituals is basically can be translated into like ibadah right. or like yeah. a, or adab, like adab, like a morality or the courtesy. Right. <clears throat> and oh, it is I just, so I just say, I suppose from an Islamic point of view, this is this is uh, very uh, understandable because the fitra, this innate disposition that human beings have, Islamically speaking. You know, to to uh, not only to relate to the divine, but also to believe in justice and uh, and goodness and so on. That this is expressed both, um, obviously, in Islam, but also uh, it, it, w- w- when it occurs in an uncorrupted form in Confucian teaching. So one would expect, given the nature of human beings as made by God, that these natural dispositions to uh, adapt, as as you say, uh, to good behavior, is intrinsic into the. A purified human soul, or, or a good person, and so it's perhaps not completely unexpected that the, the best of Chinese and the best of Islamic um, adab could, should be so similar as Liu Zi is saying here. Uh, yes, now you're true, and 
also like you know this their method of articulating like Islam uh, is really gives me a uh, useful insight as like the Japanese Muslim uh, because this shows that you know the, every society has a different method of convincing something mm. it means like every people have a different logic like for example like I also read like lots of like Japanese translation of like Islamic books like uh, which were written in like America or the Europe and Germany and I know uh, and I can understand the uh, the uh, how those books are sophisticated and I also respect the contents but as a Japanese I uh, I was not convinced by their like logic or the art you know the method of the talking about Islam like sometime I found uh, I mean this is just my personal opinion like you know, other Japanese might yeah, think uh, differently but you know some of the books you know they sorely focus on like a, like a metaphysics like a metaphysical side of Islam, like how and how, and they try to show that how sophisticated manner, you know, they can teach, uh, they can explain uh, the wonders of the creation mm-hmm. in like Islamic mm-hmm. vocabulary. And uh, it must, but in as East Asians, like you know, we also care about, like, you know, uh, we also care about metaphysics, but what we care mostly is this rites and ritual, I mean, the practice. Mm-hmm. And and Islam and Chinese Islamic scholar like you know, know about this. Like you know, there is even a hadith called like a to had this nas al him. It means like talk to the people according to their akad, I mean like reason. But here, you know, I interpret this hadith like talk to the people according to their own context. Yeah. And this Chinese, you know, this Chinese Islam, you know, really gives me like really, uh, uh, the important insight that you know, if you're a Japanese, then we also uh, uh, we also have like an, our unique context or our unique method to articulate the, the concept of Islam or rectify ourselves in an Islamic way. Mm-hmm. Like, so this is how, you know, that, uh, so that's why, you know, these words are really not, on, uh, not only like academic like inquiry, but it really close to my heart. Oh, lovely. And Another really exciting thing that I really like the most is like this Islam and Kung Fu. Like, you know, like I'm sure everybody knows about Kung Fu, like, you know, like Jackie Chan or like Bruce Lee. Like, you know, I also like you know, the Kung Fu when I was a kid. But, uh, but, uh, uh, when I started like, studying about Chinese Islam, you know, I was so surprised that you know, most of the major, uh, most of the you know, famous Kung Fu today were developed by like a, uh, the Chinese Muslims, oh, okay. especially like uh, uh, Naqshbandi, like a Su- uh, Naqshbandi Sufis. Mm-hmm. So this Kung Fu was once the spiritual practice of the Naqshbandi Sufi tariqas. Wow. Yeah, this is the method that how they you know, refine their soul. You know, this is how they rectify, you know, their heart. Mm-hmm. But but unfortunately, nowadays, like when you, when you heard Kung Fu, like have you, uh, have you, started, have you watched Shan Tsui, the Marvel hero comics, like Chinese, the Chinese hero play the character? Okay. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> anyway, I'm not, I'm not familiar, I must say, with that. Okay, so this is one of the latest, you know, Kung Fu oriented films that I watch, you know. So what I will say is that, you know, when you hear Kung Fu, everybody thinks that Kung Fu is just martial arts. Yeah, 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 which is which is like you know the play in like in the uh, cool hero movies and such. But but word kung fu itself it doesn't mean like in you know, the martial arts. Hmm. Uh, kung fu means like rectifying the you know, or, or controlling your soul, like controlling your desire. Really? But in Arabic, it's like a tadbir, like you don't be Yeah. But, yeah. but so. Here, if you study the history of you know, the Kung Fu or other like a practical side of Chinese Islam, we know how uh, how rich heritage they have, but all, and also in the same time, how much how can I say these rich heritage are reduced into some kind of like a cultural exotic commodities. Mm-hmm. 
Like now, Kung Fu was once like a you know, sincere spirit, spiritual practice of the Nakshbani Sufis, but now people are using Kung Fu for like a daily exercise or okay. just like in martial arts in the movie. Yeah. And, yeah. and this is not only about like Kung Fu. For example, yoga is also the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, like there is a famous Islamic scholar called Biruni. Uh, and Biruni also had one famous book about like a uh, treatise of uh, analysis about like a, about yoga, mm-hmm. yoga practices, and uh, and Biruni didn't see yoga as like an exercise or like a cool like a sports uh, which is practiced by like I don't know Calif- um, rich people in California. You know, <laughs> he also accept that you know yoga is a sincere uh, ibadah you know, for like Hindu people. And he and he tried to analyze, you know, analyze the yoga in an academic way. So the Biruni's book about yoga is uh, can be can be uh, understood as the first, how can I say, books on like religious studies. Right. And, and this is what Islamic civilization had. Like, you know, they always take the, you know the local practice like seriously, and you know, they don't. Uh, but if you only see, if you only studies the. The East Asian like a concept in English translation, like we uh, sometimes we might not be able to notice the this rich historical or sociological or the cultural like a, a, the context. Mm-hmm. For example, I am Japanese and also I uh, I am uh, I am studying about the tea ceremony. That in English we call tea ceremony. And when we uh, when we when we say tea ceremony, it sounds like a tea party. Like you know, it sounds like, it, it sounds like you're going to the Boston Tea Party and sorry, exactly. Okay. It doesn't. <laughs> yes, but this tea ceremony is also in original Japanese where we call te sado, and sa means tea, and dao is the way path, is the path of tea or the way of tea. So this tea ceremony was also like a spiritual path mm-hmm. to reach the reality. By serving tea, you know, for the, for the others, you know, for you know the guests. Gotcha. So, and in Chinese, in Chinese, something they, they call this tea ceremony as like kung fu te dao, like a kung fu tea ceremony. Right. But if you only know the English translation, you <laughs> only understand what it means, martial arts tea ceremony thing. Exactly, like, it sounds a bit it weird. Doesn't make yeah. any sense. So, <laughs> it's like it's really important for us, like you know, uh, to study like in East, East Asian history. Within their own context, you know, within their history, like within their like languages, and this Han Kita tradition or the Chinese Islam, like offers us, or the or the makes us realize that we're forgetting this heritage. Yeah. Like even the tea ceremony, like, before studying Han Kita, I never took it seriously. Like tea, I saw tea ceremony it was this tea ceremony, even though I I was practicing the tea ceremony. But uh, but the study of Chinese Islam. Uh, help me to notice that we are in so-called like semantic confusion. Like this is what you know terminology used by Nakibar Atas. Like we don't know how each of the words uh, connected to each other under like a certain tapestry of of the how you say like network of the United Cultures. Like am I making sense clear? Like no, yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. No, it's it's, it's it's an important lesson, yeah, to ret- retain the original cultural uh, context of these, and rather than the Hollywoodization of them, which obviously debases and drains the uh, the meaning out of them. Yes. Okay. Well, the third part is that you know, uh, you know, I would like to to talk about you know reading the Hankita as like a minority literature mm-hmm. because another interesting aspect of the Chinese Muslim community is that they have been always a minority. Mm. Like they are under like non-Muslim like rule and they have been always a minority and they cannot, uh, they were not in like a top of a society. I mean, there are some Muslim elites, but they, but they were, all, they were always elite in every, uh, in every section, in every aspect. And this situation is actually like, you know, it, it resembles to our situation. Our means like, you know, like for example, like Japanese Muslim living in Japan or European Muslim living in European, uh, European like countries. Like you, uh, we are also living in a non-Muslim like, country as a minority. And, but the, even the Chinese, uh, uh, so, so, even Muslim Chinese, they know about the difficulties, and 
interesting about this reading Han Kitab is sometimes, you know, this Chinese Islamic scholar didn't complain about their loneliness. Mm-hmm. Something in the preface of, you know, his, uh, in pre- preface of these books. For example, like Liu Zi, uh, uh, he authored the, uh, the Chinese tradition translation of the life of, life of Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in the preface, uh, he confessed that how much difficulty he faced to author that book. Mm. And he's, and it was also interesting, I want to quote, he said, I have no friends, I have no colleagues, and my family and relatives accuse me of wasting time on such useless things when writing books. And I conduct my research activities alone. And he said, I'm writing the books alone. And I'm proofreading my books alone by myself. And I'm copying the books alone. And not for a moment, one moment, did my heart feel at this. And my relatives did not support me. So I have to move houses several times. Wow. Like, oh my God, he looks like a PhD student yeah. in the 20th century. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. So even though he is one of the most respected Islamic scholars, and in Islamic history, that he also feel that always loneliness, that, and he didn't get understanding from uh, uh, from as I say, his surrounding. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and another uh, Han Kitab I want to introduce is this uh, Jin Tianzu's like a book. Uh, the he Jian Tenzu, that he lived in the 19th century, like uh, in China, and like Liu Zi, uh, oh, he was from Nanjing, like this. So Nanjing is a famous like a city, uh, which produced like lots of famous like Islamic scholar, and he was like a bureaucrat, like working at the translation center of the Hanlin Academy under the direct control of the empire. So he was like one of the top of the elite. Like like Liu Zi was like a Hong, so he was like a chef or like an Arim. So his job was to like lead Muslim as mm-hmm. like Islamic scholar. But the Jin, uh, this Jin job was working with like in the colleagues and his colleagues were basically like non-Muslims. So, uh, and he had, and he had experiences as a minority in the bureaucracy. And at the time, you know, and he, and in the preface, he said that sometimes these non-Muslim colleagues and Muslim communists, you know, start fight each other in a translation center, they, they started like a curse, curse each other and they just said, I know that, oh, you Muslims are, I don't know, doing something like that. So, and I want to introduce in his preface. So he says, those who believe in other religion do not understand their practice and their doubts have not been removed for 1,100 1, years. They still, do not know, they still do not know why we have this belief in Islamic belief and practice because they have not studied the books of Islam. And ignorance and ignorance increased suspicion towards us and the negative rumors about Islam like foolish. And he also listed, you know, the, you know, uh, the question that he was asked when he was working in the translation center. He said, why Muslims are not following the Chinese calendar, but uh, secretly create their own so-called Hijri calendar and they gather together to celebrate their own like festival. Mm-hmm. And why do they, you know, Muslim eat meat and vegetable at sunset and nothing during the day? You know, basically he talk about like Ramadan, you know, yeah. fast. Yeah. And what God do they worship when they're praying? And what do men, do men and women do when they gather together at night and return at dawn? You know, it talks about a touch, you know, the midnight prayer. Mm-hmm. And why do they trim, trim hair? And beard and and hair the bodies and the parents, but they cast away their bodies because in China, and when the people pass away, and usually they burn the bodies. Right. But the Muslim, you know, they you know uh, they have to bury the bodies. Yeah. People asking why they are burn, they burning the bodies and they make them look weird. It means like you know, uh, when uh, once they are buried in the bodies, the body get decomposed. So this is what you know scared you know non-Muslim Chinese. You know why they don't burn the body and stop them mm-hmm. burning under the underground and they become the weird. And this is really surprising. Like why they using why why are you using different calendar? Why are you why are you eating? Uh, why you're not eating anything pork in yeah. the daytime? And also, uh, Jian Tenzu will ask why are you so picky about food <laughs> and why are you gathering in certain times? Like these old questions 
are all the questions that we ask in the 21st century. If you're living in the yeah, like, well, why don't you drink alcohol? Yeah, I've been asked this so many times. Well, you know, do you want to drink? No, I don't, I don't drink alcohol. You know, well, why not? <laughs> These are still issues, and people should know, obviously, that uh, what's yes. what. But yeah, absolutely. So, Jean confronted this prejudice and saying that this prejudice against Islam is that due to ignorance of non Muslim, you know, Chinese. Yeah. But more importantly, Jean says that this is actually the mistake of the Muslim who are incapable of removing that ignorance. Wow. That's quite a hard statement, isn't it? Because it's blaming the Muslims for not communicating, perhaps, effectively the reasons for their beliefs. But I, I think, yeah, maybe. But there's also, there are, there are some other people who really just don't like Muslims or Islam and don't want to understand. There's a, hard, there's a harshness sometimes. And not, not frequently, perhaps, but I've seen it, a harshness towards Muslims just because they're Muslims. Yes. So, like Jin, so this Jin says that uh, no, uh, there's about two. Uh, so, if, if he analyzes a problem in these issues, he found out two ignorance. One part is the ignorance of the part of non-Muslim, and another part is ignorance about you know, the Muslim who are not who are not trained enough to explain uh, you know the cultures or the concept of Islam to the non-Muslims. Yeah. So he said that, you know, yeah. this is why he also his book, you know. Uh, this elimin el eliminating the doubts against like Islam. It's called a like, changing shi in Chinese. Right. Uh, <clears throat> and his arguments, you know, and the main topic of this book is really similar to Liu's position. He says that yes, like many so-called ordinary Chinese are criticizing like uh, like Chinese Muslims or mocking Chinese Muslim. But he said, how many people in Chinese Chinese society are actually practice Confucianism ideals. Mm. Like he said that many, many Chinese Muslims are saying that you know this Islam, uh, like Islam is so strange and Muslims are practicing differently, but while Confucianistic ideals are great, and why they are not like accepting you know our so-called religion or tradition. But he was saying that, yeah, like you know, Chinese ideals are great, you know, this Confucianist uh, the great sage, Confucius is a great sage. But he was saying that how many Chi ordinary Chinese Muslims are actually practicing it? Like, like talking about Confucianism is easy, but practicing Confucian ideas is a different level. Mm -hmm. And Jin said that we Muslim practice the Confucian teaching more than any Chinese. Mm -hmm. So he also emphasized the practical aspect of the East Asia tradition. There's a great irony here. We, we have this in the, in the West. In, in my view, is that in my view, Muslims who practice their faith are closer to Jesus, uh, the, the actual historical Jesus, uh, who was a first century Palestinian Jew who didn't eat pork, who prayed to the one God, uh, mm -hmm. and, and so on and so on. That many Jewish practices are very similar to Islamic practices. But that, that similarity is, is not found between Jesus and modern Christians in the West, who largely rejected the Jewish uh, the Jewish Jesus, the Jewish of history, uh, the Jesus of history, in favour of a Hellenised um Romanized Jesus of uh, of faith, and so the irony here is that Muslims are actually closer to the, the origins of Christianity to Jesus than Christians are. So we have this double, yeah, the same dynamic here that the Muslims are often closer to Confucian practices because they're they, they are so similar, and the other Chinese simply not practicing Confucianism at all. So we have the same kind of dynamic going on in these two minority communities. Ah uh, yes, like, like he also introduced one criticism uh, from the you know, Buddhist monk. That Buddhist monks were saying that the Muslims are too picky about food. Uh, <laughs> he was saying that actually Confucianist analects, you know, the Confucianist like, classics also talk about you know we should be picky about food, like we should be <laughs> careful about food. Yeah. And uh, also the Buddhism of Buddhism as well. You know, Buddhists should be like a vegetarian. They should not eat meat. And and it was really funny that he, he said that the Buddhist monk are. Uh, they are saying that you know, they are following like a you know the Buddha's the teaching in the public, but I know that you are eating pork secretly. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean that uh, this is uh, I mean uh, I, I'm not generalizing like a Buddhist like a situation like a Buddhist monk in any Chinese society, but this is what Jian Jian uh, Jin wanted to prove that yes, like in in terms of creed, maybe Islam could look different or strange because Islam believe like one God 
and they only want you know the one divine being. But in the practical level, you know, the Muslim were really, actually really sincere about like, you know preserving the East Asian like a teaching, and there is no contradiction between like East Asian like practices, traditional practices, and also Islamic practices. Mm-hmm. So this. Uh, and I'm not sure, like you know, to what extent you know these genes, like uh, I don't know, writings, had any influence in Chinese society. Because in the end, he was also a bureaucrat, and his books is <coughs> his book might not reach to like ultimate Chinese people because they don't have like in you know, literacy, you know, before the modernization. But what we know at least is that even this Hanli Academy, in a place where the elite of non-Muslim Chinese gathered. It's like Jin did not lose like, his pride, you know, in being a Muslim. Right. In pride of you know, being a Muslim intellectual. And he even claimed that we are more Chinese, like more than the average Chinese. Like, mm-hmm. So I have reintroduced like really general history of Chinese Islam uh, about and Catholic Islam, you know, this Chinese Islamic scholarship and also the efforts of Chinese Islamic scholars as a minority. Uh, but fine, uh, but again, like, I would like to consider what it means for Muslims even today to study Chinese Islamic heritage. Because it, it, if you're just like narrating the historical events about the Chinese Islam, you know, there are, mo- there, there are lots of experts about Chinese Islam, like in the, not, not, not only me, uh, but, uh, but now uh, I believe that we are, uh, but, uh, we Muslim, as a Muslim, you know, we can learn much from them. Like, first, I believe that this Chinese Islam, you know, provides an important perspective not only for, not only for East Asian, but also like uh, minority Muslims living in non-Islamic countries. Like as I said, that not only the Muslim minority in China, but also in the UK or the France or Germany or the United States or in Japan. Mm. And, and also the effort to explain Islam in Chinese uh, and language with it. Actually, the Chinese has a really different historical and cultural background, you know, Chinese languages. But, but, uh, but you know, their challenges is actually, actually the same challenges that we are facing right now as well. For example, like, I know Ustaz, you are also like a British, but you are uh, organizing uh, like a program in English, you know, uh, your native languages. And actually, this is like historical process that, you know, English is now becoming like Islamic language, right? Yeah, but it's exactly right. Now we have indigenous Islamic writers, most famously Dr. Tim Winter, perhaps at Cambridge University, otherwise known as Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. Obviously, he's English and he happens to be a very brilliant man and he writes very beautifully in English. Uh, other people like Guy Eaton, uh, who passed away a few years ago, wrote a very beautiful English. These were indigenous English Muslims writing and elevating the English language uh, to be a vehicle for Islamic ideas. Uh, and they were perfectly kind of um, s- s- the perfect relationship between the two. So become, it, English becomes a vehicle for Islamic thought and ideas and sometimes polemics. So it's not just uh, a, um, a foreign language anymore. It's part of the English uh, thought and expression itself. Uh, yes, like for example, like like for me, like you also look really British, like, like you UK citizen, but also you're Muslim, right? Yes. So, so you are like a British version of a like, Jan Tanzu or like a Lucy, like, like. I, I guess. So, <laughs> so they share like so you know they had like you know similar history, you know, similar experiences. Yeah. And the second one is Chinese Muslim, like teaches us the way of living as like a proud minority under the non-Muslim rulers. Mm. Not just trap into like apologetic like discourses, not just falling into so-called like a, like a victimized like a mindset. Mm. Uh, but, you know, but do you know, but Jin said that Muslim are the people who understand and practice Chinese ideal, ideals like most deeply than mm. any other like a Chinese citizen in that time. Wow. Like for example, like I am Japanese Muslim and, uh, and also I'm a minority, but I'm also questioning myself, like, can I say that I am more Japanese than the ordinary Japanese? Mm. Or is there not only Japanese, but is there a Muslim who understand like England better than a non-Muslim, like Englishman? Or is there a Muslim who can understand and practice, I don't know, French ideals, French vision more correctly or appropriately than like a non-Muslim Frenchman? 
Like, this is the question that, you know, the, the Chinese Islamist scholar、uh, try to answer it. Like, and so, this is the question that you know, we, this minority Muslim, should also face. And this Chinese Islamist scholar like, gave us, like, you know, Uh, let's say, made us realize that we are also not special. Like what we are experiencing right now has been already experienced by the Muslim who live as a minority in the past.、Mm-hmm. And, uh, and furthermore, rather, we should ask like, do we have the same pride that the Chinese Muslim had in the past? Like Jian Tenzu or like Liu Zi. Like this is why I'm always asking myself. like, So, studying about the history of Islam in China like it pre- uh, actually pre- presents us like, many questions. Like,、mm-hmm. so, like, this, uh, so, this is you know, the, all about my presentation. Basically. So, thank you very much for hearing me. Well, that's, that's amazing. Thank you very much indeed for that.、Uh, and just on that last point, I think it's slightly different for、uh, in, perhaps I'm, just my own view. That there have, hasn't really been any substantial Muslim presence in England or, or in France. In the previous centuries. Uh, uh, so it's, it's a more recent thing to do with immigration in the 20th, 20th century. But I, I still think Muslims can bear witness to the Abrahamic religion, to the Abrahamic faith,、uh, the faith of Abraham and the prophets and Jesus and so on, peace be upon them all, as Europe becomes ever more secular and ever more materialistic and individualistic and liberal or whatever.、Um, So, it is, Muslims can bear witness to that ancient faith, to Tawheed, to monotheism, and, and be perhaps the only remaining witness to monotheism left in Europe as the churches here are, are, are becoming extinct uh, uh, virtually. Um, and, but, but Muslims are retaining their faith, it seems to me,、uh, it, it, quite, quite solidly, certainly in the United Kingdom anyway.、Um, but, but we can bear witness to traditional values, these values that Britain and Europe. Used to uphold, and these are wholesome values, natural va- values that enhance and ennoble the human being rather than splinter them off into identities and factions and arguments about、uh, you know, LGBT pride and all that, but to a more traditional wor- worldview, which is a more accord perhaps with our fitra, our, our natural disposition, which Islam obviously emphasizes in a very helpful way. So I think, I think there's much that European Muslims can contribute. Spiritually and culturally, and in terms of a dab to、uh, u- the European context. But I don't think we have、uh, China, as you very clearly and eloquently stressed, has a Muslim history going back virtually to the Sahaba, almost to the beginning of Islam.、Uh, but we don't really have that in Europe, unfortunately.、Um, that is a more recent import, if I can put it that way. I mean, even it's the most、uh, you know, recent import. I mean, just.、Uh, I mean, look at Japan. Japan is like Jap- Japan's situation is worse. Like, we have most recent <laughs> import. And even the first, our first interact with the Muslim country is like a colonial policy site. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, uh, uh, it might be a little bit off the topic, but the, another great thing about the, I don't know, the, what this Islam, Chinese Islamic scholar gives me the courage is that if you look at Han Kitab, yes, they are derived. They are borrowing many vocabularies from Buddhism or Confucianism or Taoism,、mm. but it doesn't mean that they compromise、right. the other society. Like, you know, they're trying to prove that they can use this vocabulary better than、right. the other society. Like, you know, that I always feel this strong pride you know, of being like a Chinese Muslim. And this Chinese Muslim is like, as I said in the first, in the first presentation, it, means, it doesn't mean like Chinese Muslim nationalists. No. But believing that, you know, they are, they believe that, you know, Chinese version of Islam is the best version of Islam、uh, compared to the other,、mm-hmm. like,、uh, local Islamic cultures. So what they believe that is Islam gives them the power to articulate the Islamic concept. With the, uh, with the, lo- uh, with the, the uh, with the, uh, local vocabulary, the most beautifully. So,、mm-hmm. what they aim is that being just being the best of the Muslim. And, and this being, being best of the Muslim means like the best of the you know, Chinese citizens. Like,、mm-hmm. Yeah, no, the emphasis on character, good behavior,、uh, being a good citizen is, is really、uh, you know, fundamental, I think, to, to, to being a Muslim. And that's something that, again, can, 
uh, be, be a, a positive influence uh, on that. And I, th I think there are many aspects of English culture which uh, Muslims can engage with positively and not necessarily, uh, well, adopt actually uh, and Islamicize or, or, or give Islamic flavor, both in terms of history or poetry or uh, um, you know various epochs in the past, like going into all of that. But there are many, there are many points of connection. I think that can be made, and the Muslims can can make that connection and speak of them in an Islamic sense, but nevertheless pointing out those points of commonality or even identity. Um, there's some wonderful passages in Shakespeare, for example, uh, which speak about the grace of God in a very Islamic way, and even the concept of God is very Islamic. Without right? going into to that, but there, there are many many points of contact that Muslims can make. Uh, w w with the indigenous tradition here, I think. Um, but I, I do want to mention this book, which I know you, you, you're aware of. It's called uh, Islam in China by Professor James uh, D. Frankel. He's a, a professor in, um, for this, in the study of Islamic culture at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, uh, obviously in China. Um, and, and this book uh, looks at the history of Muslims in China spanning over 1,200 years, uh, right from the Tang Dynasty starting in 618 right up to the present day. So this is a single volume history of China written with Muslims and Islam at the center rather than at the margin. So this is a highly recommended book. I, I know so you, you have uh, aware of this and recommend it as well. Uh, that's the, the back cover. Um, so I, I got it uh, from Amazon, I think. So it's available in English, of course. Yeah, I believe it is one of the best uh, international books. Like it, uh, it covers from the very beginning of the Islamic history uh, until the present. So, and he also covers the contemporary issues about the situation of Muslim in China. So, yeah, right. it's a really comprehensive book. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm glad there's, it's, there's something that we can, uh, for those of us who wanted to, to in, inquire into this uh, further, recommended reading. Uh, that's the book, I think, to go to. Um, <clears throat> to just finally, if I can ask you, uh, Doctor, um, what, what, what are you working on at the moment and where do you see your work uh, developing in the future in terms of your Islamic studies? Is that, do you mean my current, my recent activities? Yeah. Yes. And, and how you see the future? Are, are, you, are you going to remain in Turkey, perhaps? Or are you going to focus on Tassawulf in the... Uh, in the Far East, in the uh, in China, or are you going to move into other areas of subjects? Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I love you know living in Turkey, mm. uh, and actually I have so many so many dreams. <laughs> uh, like you know, like my but basically my dream is to try to uh, establish the soil or try to how can I say to cultivate the, the soil in Japan. So that in 100 years, or maybe like 1,000 years later, you know, there will be uh, like you know, the indigenous, like Japanese Islamic scholar. Like, you know. uh -huh. because I'm, I'm a Japanese Muslim convert, and I'm also studying like in you know, classical Islamic sciences, and also I'm studying about history of Islam in Turkey, about Turkey and China mm -hmm. as well. But I know I'm just you know what I'm just like a part of this whole uh, uh, Jap Japanese history of Islam and. And uh, I'm not that arrogant enough that I can be like a perfect exemplar of the, the Japanese Islamic history. But what I want to do is that I want to contribute for the next generation. Mm. Uh, so because uh, then during my uh, journey of Islam, like, I also faced lots of like, challenges and difficulties. And for example, when I first become Muslim, I thought that, you know, become Muslim is that accepting Islamic culture from outside and try to be one of them. Yeah. Like, like I also, and I also wear like a Garabeya, like Arabic clothes and also like Malaysian or Indonesian clothes. And also I try to cook uh, like a Turkish cuisine. So I like Turkish cuisine and also I like like Arabic and Malaysian clothes. But, uh, but in the end, I felt that I'm losing, I would say. I, I started, uh, I felt that I'm losing myself, or I was like, how can I locate myself? And, and I want the next generation to be proud of like a Japanese Muslim, if they become Muslim, like a John Tenzin or Luzi did. So now I'm trying to translate the Islamic classic, like a Turkish, written in Turkish languages, Ottoman languages, or the Persians, or the Chinese, anything we do. I mean, to I, I am tr now translating this Islamic classic into Japanese as much as possible. Wow. So that, you know, they can know that, uh, that 
articulating like Islam in Japanese language is possible. Mm-hmm. I mean, even uh, even though I know this is not like the best quality, but you know they can create like the best quality of like Japanese uh, like Islamic like books. Mm-hmm. So now I'm translating uh, Yunus Emre's like Turkish poetry into Japanese, and and also I'm translating some of the Han Kitab into into Jap- into Japanese and also English as well. Uh, in Shanda, right. uh, can publish, and also I'm translating this Han Kitab into Turkish language as well, because some I think this is one of the problem. As I said, you know, this nation state mindset is mm. so firmly uh, embedded in our brain. Yeah. So every Muslim think that they, they uh, every Muslim think that their version of Islamic culture is the best. For example, if they are like a Turkish, they think that Turkish Islam is the best. And if they are like, you know, I don't know, Egyptian Muslim, they think the Egyptian Islamic culture is the best. I mean, and if they are Pakistani Muslim, you know, they think the Pakistani uh, Islamic culture is the best above all. And it's okay that, you know, we, have, we, we, uh, we feel proud of our own culture, but our uh, ethnocentrism is the different thing. Mm-hmm. So, and for example, in Turkey, like, you know, there are so few people know about like a Chinese Islamic history. And they only uh, think that this Chinese Muslim could be, I don't know, kind of uh, exotic guy mm-hmm. who know Kung Fu and the social transfers, the kind of thing. But, but we Muslim should know that is, uh, Islamic civilization is diverse. Yeah. And uh, Tawhid has the, this dynamic potential which allows us to uh, uh, observe the richness, uh, the rich, like a, cu- like, a, like a cultural like a manifestation. And like, in terms of the Japanese, like, with, uh, as I said, like, some people ask me, like, why are you studying about like, it, uh, like a history of Islam in Turkey or why I'm studying about history of Islam in China, even though I'm Japanese? Like, like I don't want my nation state identity limited my academic end of it. It's a very uh, a strange question to ask. I mean, you know, you, you got English professors who study Chinese history or African history or anything history. No one ever says, well, why are you doing, why are you studying um, Chinese history? Because you're not Chinese, you're English. I mean, no one ever says that, but, but they ask you that question about why you are Japanese uh, Muslim studying China. It's, it's a really odd thing to ask. What, 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 why shouldn't you study China? I mean, yeah, it's an obvious thing. Is is yeah. Because in the end, this is humanity. Humanity is being humanity. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly. open for everyone, and especially, uh, and especially, you know, we like Muslim, we are so haunted by this, this the uh, uh, this like national identity. So we should reconstruct, you know, uh, our identity as the like, member of the United Ummah, mm-hmm. and. And we should learn the lesson, not only from our own heritage, but also the heritage of the other in the culture as well. Mm-hmm. Like we, we can we can learn, we can learn uh, much from like a Turk, uh, like a Anatolian Islamic history, well, but also from the Chinese, but also the African, and also like we uh, from Central Asia and also from Pakistan as well. Like in, <laughs> we should not <clears throat> instead we should not like limit ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, but uh, uh, but I know the you know, prob- problem of the, you know, the, the language difference of the language is a really challenging thing. So, uh, so that's why you know, in- inshallah, like you know, I'm trying you know, uh, that I want to translate those classic into not only Japanese but mm-hmm. the English or the Turkey uh, or the Turkish language uh, as much as possible, so that you know we can like re- we can intellectually reunite again, like as I call, because Islamic civilization is a kitab civilization. Yeah. Like, as long as there is the kitab, then you know, we, should re- uh, we should gather. Right? Yeah. And so you're doing absolutely amazing work, uh, um, quite, quite extraordinary, and I, I, do, I do applaud you for what you're doing. And you're doing it on your own. You're, you're, you're a pioneer in some ways. You're translating this stuff for the first time into Japanese, and you're, you're thinking about identity and the nation state and, and the Ummah, and you're trying to reclaim Chinese Islamic history and make that known to people through talking to, like, you know, coming on now. And this is an extraordinary work you're doing, absolutely amazing. And I, I, I do commend you, you for that, and thank you for doing that. And, uh, 
And in some ways, you're like an Al Ghazali figure for today as well. You're, you're you know, you're presenting Islam in to a, a new culture, um, to, to to the Japanese culture, which has no, as you say, no real history of um, the Islamic tradition in Japan, but in on China, obviously, is a huge tradition. And I mean, for me, one of the takeaways from this is. You know, uh, you know, our, our preoccupation with you know the Asherites and the Materides and, and you know, the Atherites, you know, about the the issues to do with Greek philosophy and the Hellenization of of Islamic knowledge and the, philo- the, the philosophers, the philosophers, and all. but actually, there's a parallel tradition, uh, the Kitab tradition in in China, which is not um, concerned with those issues so much, but with Confucianism. Uh, and so it has its own indigenous expression, and that, and that's something that we need to bear. Many of us need to bear in mind that it's not all just about the Arabic interest in uh, in Hellenistic philosophy. There's actually another philosophical tradition that has engaged the best of Muslim minds over the centuries. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, we have sometimes I use the different terminologies that, you know, uh, when I classify this East Islamic civilization and West Islamic civilization. I call no, is the Middle East and Europe is even Sina civilization, like Avicenna civilization, mm-hmm. and China Chinese Islam is the this Confucian like civilization. Wow, like like Europe is like the everyone thinks that Europe is like you know uh, I don't know uh, the alien to the Islamic civilization. Actually, not. Like if we in, if we intellectually trace the the origin of this like modern European civilization, I mean not not I mean not talking about pre modern. No, postmodern European civilization, but it's the off. Uh, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, it's offshot of the inter- uh, tradition of the interpreting like uh, Avicenna, like the uh, heritage. So actually, the European civilization is uh, philosophically is a part of Islamic civilization. Yeah, this is just a fundamental truth that the Europeans most Europeans haven't quite got yet. And this is, nevertheless, is well-researched, well-substantiated in the academic literature. What you're saying is very true, but most Europeans are not part of our consciousness quite yet. We're not quite there. But yes, yes I and, agree. Yes, and do you remember, like, you know, some of the scholars, they claim that this new Confucianism uh, uh, was born under the influence of the Islam, uh, the Luzi's, uh, like, uh, Luzi's works, like in this Islamic theology. And, Actually, during the other period, the Japan has also in her, uh, import the this neo Confucian philosophy, and we are also in, under the influence of neo Confucianism. So, if Japan this under the influence of this non neo Confucianistic uh, worldview were actually under the influence of the Duzi's philosophy, mm-hmm. then Japan could be the part of the Islamic civilization as well without knowing it. Without knowing it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh well. Well, thank you very much for that. It's absolutely uh, fascinating. Uh, for, thank you very much for your contribution. This is Dr. Noaki uh, Yamatoto, who is a professor at the Graduate School of Turkic Studies at Mamara University in Turkey. Um, and um, uh, uh, thank you very much again for uh, your presentation. Absolutely fascinating. Um, I'll, I'll link to uh, this book. So if you want to follow up on Islam in China. Um, and uh, is there anything um, I could link to from your work, sir, in your in the description below that I should share? Do you think uh, you can uh, you can post my uh, Twitter link then? Link to Twitter, okay? Yeah, because I know you. I do follow you on Twitter, and you're quite active on Twitter. So yeah, I'm addicted to Twitter. So they have some bad habits. Addicted like me, oh dear, we're, we're two <laughs> fellow addicts on Twitter. Uh, well, that's good actually to have a Twitter. Uh, link. So I'll link to you on Twitter and you can f- follow, uh, you know, we'll follow your work and your train of thought um, on a daily basis, it seems. So anyway, that's great. Well, thank you very much indeed for your time. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.